Good morning. 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 Really good to uh, be with you. My name is Mike Simmons, and I'm visiting you today. I come from Hadley. Uh, at least I live in Hadley. I don't come from there. I come from South London, but that's another story. Uh, but it's good to be with you this morning. Um, my normal church of worship is uh, St Michael's Westcliff, where I'm very active in the as a member of the congregation in all sorts of ways, including preaching from time to time. So it's uh, slightly unusual to be out preaching um, because I'm not so engaged there, but it's good to have this opportunity. Not least because uh, churches tend to get over Easter too quickly in my mind. Uh, I think we should have Easter every Sunday in a way. <laughs> and uh, this morning we're going to continue with Easter. So let me remind you of the words of Jesus. And uh, I'd like to hear a resounding yes um, at the end, because he asks a question at the time, and uh, I want to ask it of us. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, this is Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes. Yes. Yeah, on, right. That's good. Yes. Well, let's... Father, as we come into your presence, there are more than 10,000 reasons why we would praise you. Easter is the great heart of that sense of worship and praise that is in our hearts and on our lips. For we know without the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no hope. And that in him there is salvation. That greatest of all gifts of all time for all men and women. And Lord, as we come to you individually this morning and as a collective group of people, there are many other things on top of all of that that we would praise you for in our lives. For another week and for another Sunday, a day when we can come apart in this way to be in your presence and with each other. For health, however limited that may be for some of us, still being able to get around and to get out and to come. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your presence with us is uh, assured day after day, whatever the ups and downs and needs of our experiences. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We pray that this morning will help us to experience more of you uh, in, in, in the future as we reflect on the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection power. And Father, we thank you that we can come because uh, we are able to, that it's, we're free to, not just because we're coming through the pandemic, but because we live in a country where this is uh, assured and available to us. And so we thank you for the work of your church around the world, but here in South End in particular, uh, and the outlying areas. And we thank you that you are building your church in different ways, in different places, in diff through different means. So we praise you this morning for who you are and for what you are doing in our lives and in our world and in our nation and in our area. We pray that you'll be with us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Here this morning. And a special welcome to Mike Simmons. He reminded me that when he was last year, we still had the scaffolding around the hall. So have, have we forgotten that? Six pm this evening, it will be taken by service taken by Roger, and communion will form part of the service. Tuesday, seven thirty, prayer and Bible study. Wednesday, six pm, boys club, and seven thirty, youth club. Friday, six thirty pm, girls brigade. The next Sunday morning, the eighth of May, ten thirty, and um, be yourself. And there'll be Jan in the Bible class. And at uh, 6 pm, we're expecting Keith Britton. Streets to remember in prayer this week Downhall Park Road, 
steeple field and Wattish Street. The UEC Church to remember in prayer this week is the one at Eastwood. And the missionary focus, but it's quite a mixed week in that I'm not sure it's out there yet, but there's a new Gretschmann's Grapevine newsletter somewhere. We also have the missionary box to put click or monetary offerings that you want to give to the missionaries that we support. But read more about it on the prayer letter. That's at the back in a temporary form at the moment. But our missionary focus for the week is in fact the London City Mission. And again that tells you more about some things on the sheet here. We also, in the porch, have some uh, books on the table there where somebody has donated <coughs> them to the church and uh, they are available to, for you to take away and keep. Have a look, see if there's any that you, you want. They're on the Bible studies and the like. And have a look, and if you want to like look at it, take it home, please. And um, June Social, excuse me for taking a bit of time here. We had the church meeting in the week and our perhaps immediate plans we had uh, thought we might do have got a little bit frustrated. So if you've had any thoughts during the week, whether we want a picnic, we want church tea, some of the following Saturday or on Sunday, have a chat with me or Sarah Jane and we'll try and collect people's thoughts together to know what to do. There will be things on the Sunday being the special bank holiday for the Queen, but uh, we'll be joining, I think, over with the Methodist Church with what they have in the afternoon. Let's just have a prayer for our offering box at the back, or the offerings, put in the offering box at the back this week. Dear Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for your goodness to us throughout another week. We are have to we are privileged and we are blessed in so many ways. We turn a tap on, we switch a light on. We go to our fridges and we find food there. We realise there are others in the world who don't have this privilege. Lord, as in some ways we bring monetary gifts for the work here and in your service, Lord bless them we pray. And as we say, may they be used well and wisely in your service. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together again uh, the song early on Sunday morning. So the whole reminder of what happened we celebrated two weeks ago.
it's 1061 page, and it's Luke, uh, it? Luke 24, verses 13 to 49. <coughs> On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one who was going to redeem Israel, and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is early evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They were there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And the Lord bless his words. Thank you very much. Quite a long reading, but it's such an incredible story, you can't break into it uh, or out of it. So, um, we had it all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your words. Sharper than any two-edged sword, and speaking to us of our Saviour. We pray that you will reveal him through your word this morning, as we come to you afresh. Familiar things, we pray that you will make them fresh and new to us this morning. That we will know the presence and the difference that Jesus brings as he draws alongside us. And we pray this for peoples around the world. 
Well, these are troubled days. We thought it was bad when we had the pandemic and were locked down and all of that. But today we know that there are thousands and thousands of refugees, particularly from the Ukraine, whose suffering is enormous, whose change of life with all the fears and frustrations and uh, all of their hopes completely dashed. We pray that within the midst of them will be people, your people, who will draw alongside and bring the peace of Jesus, the presence of Jesus in their suffering or in their travelling and suffering. And so as we, I am sure in this church, like every other church, have prayed constantly through these last, this last period um, for the people of Ukraine uh, and for the people of Russia, for the armed forces on both sides and we pray for peace in our time. We pray that the power of God will be at work in whatever means possible or even impossible to bring about a peaceful resolution to this, uh, this atrocity and this, uh, this struggle. Lord, we pray for our politicians around the world in uh, all the varieties who are responding to the situation. We pray, Father, for wisdom way beyond their own abilities to find solutions, to bring words, uh, to, to support the people in need. Father, we pray that as, that as this goes on, that the attention to detail will not be forgotten. And as we get into celebrating or dealing with other issues, and we have a number of crises even in this country, we pray that uh, the needs of the peoples of Ukraine will continue to be uh, upheld by you uh, and us in prayer and by your working through uh, those in leadership around the world. Closer to home, Father, we pray for uh, the London City Mission this morning. We thank you for their continued ministry in, in all that they are doing uh, across our capital city and with all of the opportunity that this next month might bring because we celebrate the Queen's Jubilee. And we ask you, Lord, that uh, you will meet the financial needs. We ask that you will uh, engage with uh, men and women on the streets and in centres and in all the ways that uh, the London City Mission reaches out to people. And I want to add to that prayer Lord, the use of the pocket testament John's Gospel that has been produced for uh, this Queen's Jubilee. I pray that the Word of God as it's handed out and passed on in all kinds of contexts, in street parties, church events, on the streets, and so on. We pray that it will have, and not return to you void, but will speak into the lives of people as they can contemplate the message, the word that our Queen has upheld for all of her reign and continues to, um, to live in, in accordance with. Lord, just bless her in these next weeks, increase her health, and strength to be able to join the celebrations uh, as we thank you for her and for her example. Pray too for the missionary focus here of uh, uh, the work of Jeremy Nash in Burkina Faso. We know that this is a, a really needy part of the world and we pray that you would continue to work your purposes. Well, we thank you for each and every one who's mentioned on the prayer sheet in their needs physically and uh, in their old age, we ask that you would uh, draw near to them, be near to them, and Lord, we pray that every activity that is done to serve and encourage them, that you would uh, continue to have your way. And Lord, what, what an amazing thing, 40 girls in this place last Friday. This is just a really remarkable, encouraging thing. And we pray that you will help those who are responsible and who are building for the future. So as we bring our prayers to you and many others on our hearts, we ask that you will hear and that you will do your will in the purposes of God. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's sing one more song before I bring God's word to us this morning. Um, break through the bread of life. specifically about what I would call distinctively Christian school governance. And uh, I do that in a variety of contexts, uh, slightly changed from when I was last with you. I still do a little work for the Diocese of Chelmsford in the church schools right across uh, Essex um, and into South End, although we only have one church school in South End, it seems. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but it is the case, whereas we have 160 odd uh, around uh, London and uh, East London and uh, the rest of Essex. Uh, but I now work more fully for at least three days a week for the Diocese of Chichester, which runs from Chichester right across to Rye up to East Greenstead. So it's West and East Sussex and Brighton and Hove. Uh, and there's another 169 schools, I think it is, in uh, that diocese. Doesn't mean to say I've been talking to all of them at the same time. Um, and I do most of my work sitting at my desk in Hadley, uh, either working for my, myself or uh, conducting sessions, uh, training sessions, support sessions and teamwork and a uh, whole variety of things to help governors who are governors of church schools in that diocese. So one of the big outcomes of the lockdown and, uh, and, uh, and pandemic Nobody would have guessed how that might change my work, let alone any other, anybody else's work. On the 20th of March 29, 2020, wasn't it, when we went into lockdown, I had never heard of Zoom. <laughs> and since then, I've spent hours upon hours per day uh, on Zoom or on the Microsoft equivalent of Teams. Uh, either in individual conversations or in, in training sessions, as I said. Uh, the other day, uh, of the week, I went uh, up to Carlisle, and then I was uh, across in, um, I can't remember now where it was, but uh, three different locations in, in England, 
uh, without moving an inch. Well, I did go. I did go out of my office to get a cup of tea or coffee, as you appreciate, uh, and lunch. But essentially, there's so much we can do now remotely that we could never have done before. And in fact, for school governors, it is a blessing because they don't have to travel to somewhere for a course. And so we've all seen a remarkable number of more people attending courses than we did when they had to go to Chelmsford or to, Ch to Hove, uh, Brighton, near, near Brighton, uh, for training in those two dioceses, let alone the rest of the country. I also work for Liverpool Home University. I used to go up there regularly, uh, but now I don't have to go there at all. And every uh, month in the, between January and May, uh, we hold uh, Zoom calls for the students on the course and uh, have almost 100% turnout. And uh, so we've currently got, I think, 35 people on the course. So we meet with them every, every uh, four, three or four weeks. Uh, and talk through some of the issues. And my, my absolute priority in all of this work is to help people think about how governments, and therefore their schools, the schools where they govern, are impacted by Christian thinking. How do we live out scripture, if you like, in the context of schooling as we contribute to the, to the governance of uh, the schools that we're involved in. And sometimes that involves me talking with head teachers. And, and I don't know what your, your thinking or understanding of schools are, but I have to tell you that there are some remarkable people, people of God, who are serving education in this country. Absolutely remarkable. Uh, and uh, need support because not everybody supports them. Not everybody makes their life easy. And there are two ends of the scale. There will be those who have a humanist, secularist agenda that uh, will make life difficult for the Christian post uh, as a head teacher, even as a teacher for that matter, um, even in our church schools. And then at the other end of the scale, there are some evangelicals who make life difficult for Christians doing their level best to serve God in the context of their school. So. Friday morning before I went off to the Thanksgiving service, I was having to counsel a, a, a chair of governors where this group of Christians have decided that the school is not Christian enough, which basically means they don't understand that it's a church school, not a faith school. And there is a difference in how that uh, needs to work out in the context in which they work and live. Uh, and this group of parents are making life very, very difficult for everybody. So we need wisdom as we kind of counsel and train and mentor and uh, support what God is doing in our schools. Now on Tuesday, after the bank holiday, and I don't hope to go, I am going <laughs> to uh, London, to the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. I think you may well be aware of that uh, organisation that uh, is very much about equipping Christians on the front line in their places of work. Uh, we're having a meeting of a number of us involved in education to think about how we can uh, encourage and strengthen and, uh, and equip uh, Christians in that way in our schools. I can tell you more afterwards if you want to know more. Um, it's one of those long-ended things that can go on forever. So I will get into the Word, which is why I'm here this morning. Let's just pray one more time. Lord, speak to us through the scriptures. Break the bread of life, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I began the service with uh, those words Jesus saying, I have the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Try again. Do you believe this? Yes. We're Easter people, aren't we? We're resurrection people. I asked a group of people for one word to sum up Easter, a very mixed group of people. All of them said hope. That certain hope that we have in Jesus. So this morning we're going to join those two people on their long walk to freedom as, uh, or to hope as I have entitled this, uh, this sermon, The Long Walk to Hope. 
as we continue the celebration of Easter. I took the title from Nelson Mandela's book, Long Walk to Freedom. And in that, he said, I am fundamentally an optimist. Whether that comes from nature or nurture, I cannot say. Part of being optimist, optimistic is keeping one's head pointed towards the sun and one's feet moving forward. There were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested, but I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lays defeat and death. Well, that's him with his perspective on his own life. We have a more certain hope that isn't a hopeful hope, it's a certain hope. It's a definite hope that is centred and focused in the, the Easter narrative. When I discovered I was to preach two Sundays after Easter here, I thought I'll hold on to Easter one more day or one more week and uh, I think probably if I was coming back next week, which I'm not, uh, I probably would carry on anyway. Because I don't know about you, maybe you haven't yet started having holidays again, but I discovered years ago that seven days holiday was too short. You're just about unwinding and you've got to go back. Two weeks can be a little bit too long, but I think as I've got older, it hasn't. And I used to think 10 days was the optimum holiday. But then we, just before, I think the year before uh, the pandemic, we had a two week holiday. We've got a two week holiday this summer. Because <laughs> you need the time, don't you? You need the time to continue unwinding and recharging and, uh, and engaging. And I think that's true of our Easter narrative, our Easter story. So this long walk to hope, which actually was a long walk home for these two characters in the story, was about 14,784 steps if you do that on your Fitbit or your watch. It's a long way. Poe puts it this way. It was Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, the day of going back to work, the day of routine normality. Only nothing would ever be normal again after Friday. Why did the world still turn? Days they walked the road to Emmaus, not two by two, just two. A pair of lost souls walking the sunset road, a road without rainbows. In a way, it's hard to put ourselves back into the mindset and the experience of these two followers of Jesus. They're filled with a deep sorrow of disappointment, of absolute bewilderment. We all know what it is, I'm sure, to go through bereavement. This was bigger because they had had so much invested in Jesus for their future, their nation's future. They were there when he rode into Jerusalem. The King, the Messiah, ready to deliver them in their eyes from Roman occupation. We had hope, they say in verse 21, that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. So now there's absolute hopelessness as they face more decades under the rule of Rome. This was personal. This was national. This was religious. It raised questions about their understanding of the Jewish scriptures and even Jesus' teaching over the three years. Nothing about the week before had turned out what they thought was ahead of them as they had followed him. <clears throat> the crowds turned ugly, crying out, crucify him. Crucify him. It's unlikely these two were involved in that turnaround, but they may well have been. They may have seen Pilate washing his hands despite his own attempts at releasing Jesus. Every hope and expectation was dashed. John and I, I mentioned John uh, earlier, whose Thanksgiving services was on Friday. We had um, we'd been staying at Liverpool Hope University the night of the Brexit referendum, and we were the only two out of our 
our network that were there ready for a conference starting on the Friday. He was a professor of education, so he was in the posh part. Uh, and I was just one of the visitors and I was in student accommodation. Uh, absolutely right that that was the case. But we caught up, uh, uh, met up, and uh, we went out and got some fish and chips for our supper, and we went back to his room, his rooms, mm -hmm. and we uh, enjoyed our evening together. Well, did we enjoy it? We enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed uh, chewing the cud, as you like, of thinking through and talking through uh, what was going across on the television about the referendum. Got to be really careful here, haven't I? <laughs> I don't want to divide us politically before I get right into the sermon. And the next morning when we woke up uh, in our separate parts uh, and text each other, having heard the news and the outcome, we were, I have to say, devastated. You may not share that view, but we were. I think that was something of a king, but in a very small way. You see, if Jesus had been the one to redeem Israel, one commentator puts it, he should have been defeating the Romans, not dying at their hands. So it, the plan, the expectations had all gone wrong, terribly wrong. We only know the name of one of these two people, one of the name was Cleopas. They're probably, in my understanding of this, a married couple on their way back to their home in Emmaus. Because they went home. It could have been brother and sister, but they're most likely to have been a married couple. There'd be no point in staying in Jerusalem, even though there were some, frankly, astonishing and somewhat bemusing rumours. The poem I started earlier continues. There had been rumours, rumours of angels, rumours of stones rolled away, but they had seen death, the nails, the wounds, the blood. They had witnessed the shattered body lowered from the cross, the stone rolled before the tomb. Now they were walking with the road with their backs to, Jeru to Jerusalem, away from Golgotha, away from the tomb, retreating from tragedy. See, no one comes back from the dead. No. That's a fact. No one comes back from the dead. Not in their minds. Of course, we were, we know that they were soon to discover that, but they didn't know they were soon to discover that. They were just going home. They, they would soon discover that Jesus, the crucified Jesus, was going to redeem Israel and indeed the whole world. But they didn't know that, not at that moment and in those, that, that journey. They were looking at the events through the wrong lens. They were missing the point. They were missing the narrative that Jesus lived out. They were forgetting even the words of Jesus himself, even though they must have had them stored somewhere in the back of their minds. They needed to download them as we could use a computer image. Because there's always hope in any story, in any context. Jesus had said, you will not always have me. That's a start. They really just recognised that fact. And if I go and prepare a place for you, John 14 verse 3, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. That was a promise. John 16, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I go away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There was plenty of reason to explore hope. Instead, they explored disappointments and tragedy and sadness. But this was to become a walk that I'm describing as the long walk to learn. And all of that in the company of Jesus. A stranger joins them, walks between them, matched his pace to theirs, walked the road with them. The poem continues. 
Jesus himself, it says in Scripture, came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. You see, the resurrected Jesus had no crowd to witness him at this point. There was no creating of resurrected celebrity in his appearances. There was no TV or social media to get the story out. He met with the disciples, turned up on the road. I'm actually um, unsure whether the road would have been empty, except for these two, because, well, everyone was going home from Jerusalem uh, following the Passover. So there may be, were many more people around, but this was a personal encounter for them in the midst of their sorrow, and not just for the surrounding people. What was happening right here on this road was the presence of Jesus was being realised long before they even realised it. And his perspective on what had happened in Jerusalem was being taught as they listened to him on that journey. This is definitely the company to keep for us today, to find his presence and his perspective in all that we are and do, in every moment of every day. His presence and his perspective is what we can draw on and expect. You may well be familiar with the footsteps in the sand poem, where in each scene the poet notices footprints in the sand. And sometimes there were two sets of prints, and sometimes there were only one. And one set belonged to the Lord. It says in the poem, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Have you known that? The presence and perspective of Jesus seeing you through darker times, suffering times, times of need. That poem has been an amazing comfort to millions, and rightly so. But what can we learn from this walk to learn in the company of Jesus? Because it suggests to me that he doesn't simply carry us when we're in those darker times. He carries us, but he shares with us over time his perspective. That's what enables us to begin the, the journey out of those experiences. For them, for some time, and for his own reasons, they were kept from recognising him. That's slightly puzzling, isn't it? Was it simply that their eyes were clouded with tears? Or their heads were down, their faces covered with a baseball cap or some of the equivalent? What, what was it? Why was it? I think somehow we often find ourselves in circumstances where, which can overcome us. They, it's like we cannot see the wood for the trees. Do you know that, that kind of experience? And there's something about this, but I think it was deeper than that. So I think Jesus at that moment in his resurrection body was kept from them, uh, seeing him, because there was more to experience. Yes, the promise of the resurrection had been fulfilled. He had a resurrection body, it would seem with bones, but that he could... He could do things that no normal human could do. He was resurrected the same, but different. So he comes up alongside them. And during the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus could move around like this. He could suddenly appear, not just outdoors, but right there in the room. It's like he turned up and sat on the third row back. No one saw him come. Didn't come through the doors, he just sat down, just there. Just there. And he doesn't do that now. Neither does he suddenly vanish now, because as we read in that promise a little while ago, he sent the advocate, he sent the Holy Spirit, and he is here, though we cannot see him. He is in and within each of us and all of us collectively. The question is, do we recognise him? Do we draw on him? 
do we listen and learn from him? I think it's a good job they didn't recognise him on the road. You know, when he appeared to Mary at the tomb, he had to say, don't touch me. I don't think these two would have been able to hold back and, and celebrate and hug and, and bring, draw him into their embrace. There needed to be yet more learning from this experience. And maybe if that had been where it had happened, we would have, it would never have been completed for us. Nor would we have this indication about our hope of a resurrected body for ourselves. Well, that's another story. But we who are in Christ look to that day when, like Jesus, we will be raised to be with him and will have that kind of body. Unbelievable. Or actually, believable. We trust in him for that outcome. So I come to a close by thinking about this long walk to hope again. It begins with a question. Jesus, the master teacher, and almost say, like, why didn't they recognise him from this? Because um, Jesus used questions all the time, getting right to the heart of the matter with a question. There's a book that uh, I came across for a different purpose where uh, that's entitled Jesus is the Question, the 107 questions Jesus asked and the three he answered. It's not quite what we think of, is it, when we think of the Gospels? But when you, I haven't done the calculations, I have to admit, but when you think about it, Jesus was always asking questions, 307 of them apparently. And the answer is only three of them. Jesus' questions models the struggle, the wondering, the thinking it through that helps us draw closer to God and better understand, says the author of that book. Something about the questions that opens up the thinking of anyone with a mind to consider. So he asks, what are you discussing? As if he didn't know. And that's, that's how they respond, really. Of course, they, they, they kind of think, he should know this. Hasn't he been in Jerusalem? Hasn't he witnessed what's gone on? Hasn't he, well, who is this person who asks what's happened? But what he does in ask, asking that question is provide a platform for him to answer it himself. If you turn, if you've got your Bible open to verse 25, he's a little bit... Hmm. How foolish you are. How slow to believe what all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer those things and then enter his glory? At the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Hmm. That is one sermon I wish I could hear. I wish, I do, I, I'd love it to have been recorded in all of its detail. Instead, you have to do the work. And uh, there isn't time to do that this morning, but uh, the work is really fascinating. The Just thinking how you trace Jesus from Genesis right the way through is just a remarkable thing to do. But this is how foolish you are. I don't think it's because they rejected their scriptures, not because they never read their scriptures, it's not because they never went to, to the synagogue and heard the scripture taught. It's not because they didn't believe the scripture. It's simply, this is the writings of uh, one theologian, simply because they had a partial understanding of scripture. A partial understanding of scripture is not enough. And that's hard for us, isn't it? Because understanding the scripture and studying scripture is it is a lifetime's journey and occupation. Uh, and some can get, give themselves more to it than others. But let me bring you back to this incident and say what these two on the road to Emmaus needed was fresh understanding. They needed to see all of those Old Testament scriptures and what he had taught through his lens, through his eyes. And so the greatest sermon ever preached 
which says no record, is one we need to grasp and grapple with over time. I love the story uh, about how Prince Philip, uh, Duke of the late Duke of Edinburgh, used to go home for lunch after sermons and services at Windsor and Sandringham and uh, up there in Scotland at Balmoral. And this Queen's chaplain who would have preached usually went for lunch. And I love the idea that uh, Prince Philip spent lunch, or some of lunch, raising theological points about the chaplain's sermons. I reckon they probably missed that. Because it would have been a remarkable experience. Do you think we don't ask enough questions of Scripture? Do you think we don't grapple enough with what has been preached, let alone uh, we've read? When they got back, well, after he disappeared from their sight, verse 32, they said, were not our hearts burning within us when, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now, you don't have to tell me this, but I know as, a, as, a, as someone who sits in the pew quite a lot, um, I know that your heart doesn't always burn within you as the scriptures are preached and opened up to you. But they ought to be. I'm very interested that there are three things I think you uh, are up on the screen before the service. I wonder if you've ever read them about how you as the congregation can prepare yourselves prayerfully for what God is going to say during the sermon. But that came after Jesus had disappeared from their sight. Because that, this breaking of the bread was just a remarkable thing. I forgot to put up the slide uh, about the sermon, beginning with Moses and all the prophets he explained to them. But it was in the breaking of bread that Jesus was revealed to them. Suddenly the word made sense. The suffering servant, the suffering Israel, the suffering Messiah, triumphing over death. They reached the village, the stranger stayed. He blessed the bread and broke it. Calloused hands, nail marks, the familiar crack of crust. In the sights and sounds they knew him. New hands that had broken bread for thousands. New hands that had broken bread for them. Knew the master. Suddenly, final realisation took place at that ta table. Of course, Jesus, he usurped his position as a guest. Did you realise that? It wasn't for him to break the bread and to give thanks. It was for the host, clearness. His nose could have been out of joint. But what happened here was the master the Saviour, the Son of God, took control, if you like. He broke the bread, and in the breaking of bread, they may have seen those now, Prince. They may have been reminded of the Last Supper. They may have heard Jesus' voice in Scripture and now knew him in the breaking of bread. Does that uh, in any way give you a different perspective on what you'll do this evening when you celebrate communion. So easily just becomes part of what we do, a kind of normal ritual. Will he be made known to you through the scriptures and through the breaking of bread? I think that's the intention of this, the whole uh, of the Lord's Son. And maybe something for us to, for you, or I'll be here, uh, to, 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 to be really thoughtful and prayerful about during the afternoon. Do you know as this realisation struck them, he disappeared, and they know, they know, he's risen, he's alive. He is risen. So they turned right, right, right around and in the pitch black, made their way back to Jerusalem to declare that Jesus was alive, that it all makes sense, it all makes sense. The final stanza of the poem I've been reading throughout in the moment of their knowing, he vanished. Then they realised that it was that he who had hung between the crucified broken thieves had walked between them in their brokenness. The two took to the road again, words tumbling, feet hurrying, garments flying, 
a rainbow in their hearts for promises kept and a living hope. You see, Jesus is alive. There's been some churches where you couldn't hear yourself in for the hallelujah. <laughs> Maybe that's just normal here or anywhere else, many other places. Their fired hearts came from him having explained and opened the scriptures. So not only was Jesus alive, but the scriptures were alive in their hearts and minds. It turned into them a zeal to preach the message of the resurrection, to proclaim the message of the resurrection. See, your life and my life through Easter and through life needs both the scriptures and communion with him. We need him. We need the scriptures. We need the scriptures and we need him. It's two sides of the same coin is a bit of a not the best illustration. We need both because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this is what we need and what we need to do with what we need. We need to get out there on the road. Easter people have a story like these two to tell. They started with the disciples because the scripture tells us how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How should they hear without a preacher? In the broadest sense of the word of the preacher, it's all of us really. I'm confident that Claire Hudson, maybe his wife, would have told this story again and again. You almost wonder whether you should go to their home or meet them in the coffee shop or go to their synagogue or their newly formed church. Because I, if I was Claire Hudson, I'd be saying, I told you about my walk with Jesus along the road. Never will go again. <laughs> They said, welcome to my home, come in, let me tell you about the time Jesus came and sat at his very table and broke bread. Yes, dear us, we've heard it again and again. But shouldn't that be the case? Shouldn't that be something of what we individually, collectively share together more and more increasingly? But isn't it what we should be telling people out there? Where they are. Pocket, I prayed about this, didn't I? The Pocket Testament League created a uh, version of well, John's Gospel. Really, they just put a cover on it and uh, one or two things in the front. That is freely available. If you Google Pocket Testament League, you can, you can order them, they're free. And I said to my wife this morning, because I know our church has bought uh, 200 copies of these for the Jubilee celebrations they're doing. I said, um, I've been told I can take a couple of dozen, a dozen myself, because we're not going to be around. We're going, I didn't mean to tell you this, but we're going to Sandringham. Yeah, we're going to Sandringham. We're going to stay outside of Sandringham. We're not allowed in to stay uh, for that weekend. And we're going to a concert on the uh, Friday evening. Um, we're great fans of Catherine Jenkins. She's doing a Jubilee concert in the grounds of Sandringham. I don't think the Queen will be there, which is disappointing, but the queen of, of, of music. And, and uh, I, I said to my wife, maybe we should take that um, you know, offer of a few Gospels. And when we're sitting in the crowd, think of some people, pray for some people that we might pass them on to. Uh, it's headed on the front cover, Defender of the Faith. Well, how much defending of the faith or proclamation and sharing of the faith do we do because we meet with Jesus? Because his presence is real and his scriptures speak. Let me finish with a prayer. As I came across. Risen Christ, for whom no door is locked, no entrance barred, open the door of our hearts that we may seek the good of others and walk the joyful road of sacrifice and peace to pray to the praise of God the Father. Amen. Let's stand and sing when we walk with the Lord, which really says it all, doesn't it? And I do think that I've got the title right this time. Uh, from this time.
himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Thank you, Father, for the promise. Help us to know his presence and his peace as we learn from scriptures day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh,